Hi, I'm Mike Cowell. I'm the director of the Business Innovation Zone. The Business Innovation Zone, or the Biz, was created to help high growth potential entrepreneurs and businesses in central Iowa. We provide a variety of services, including mentoring, consulting, counseling, validating business models, and help with access to funding for high growth companies. We offer also a number of networking opportunities, including luncheons uh, once a month and all day seminars on subjects such as marketing and finance. You can find out more about the biz at www.bizci.org. Thanks for the introduction, Mike. My name is Ryan Flynn. I'm a partner with Flynn Sweeney. Um, and today we're going to talk about financial management in growing businesses. Like Mike said, kind of you start off, you're a new company, uh, maybe just one person. You're the, uh, the owner of the business, also doing the bookkeeping, managing HR, doing, just doing all the, all the different roles. So kind of from that point on, what are the different roles that, uh, that uh, you need and what's the importance of strong financial management? And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some, some unconventional ways that you can get the higher level uh, financial expertise that you need in your business without bringing on the full-time resource. A lot, of, a lot of businesses may not have the ability to pay for that resource on a full-time basis, nor do they need it on a full-time basis. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, about that. Uh, first, just a little bit of my background. Mike did a good job of giving the brief history. I'm a Des Moines native, um, went to University of Northern Iowa, got my accounting degree, and then um, sat and passed for the CPA exam. Took a job up in the Twin Cities. That's the upper right-hand corner, the, the Cherry Spoon Bridge in, in Minneapolis, and spent um, time there working with a lot of large organizations for KPMG, which is one of the big multinational firms. And it's a great, great training ground. You get to see a lot of different uh, complex accounting and financial types of issues, a lot of different types of businesses. And so that was a really good way to, to kind of cut, cut my teeth in, in accounting and finance. And was fortunate enough to have uh, a client that had their European operations in Geneva. So they asked if I would go over uh, as the manager and, and do a two-year assignment. And that turned into a four-year assignment because it wasn't too bad. It was, it was kind of fun. So I stayed in uh, Geneva for, for four years, and then um, once the, 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 the family growth went on this traject trajectory and started uh, growing, we decided it was, was a good time to come back and be closer to parents and family and friends. So I came back to, to Des Moines in 2005. It was at that time that I started the predecessor firm to Flynn Sweeney, which was called Flynn Fitzgerald. And at that time, all we did was part-time CFO, part-time controller services for startups and growing businesses. And, uh, and then the last year, the firm evolved a little bit, changed the name to Flynn Sweeney when I took on a tax partner named John Sweeney. And so that kind of rounds out our, our service offering, where we've got the, the part-time CFO, part-time controller services, in addition to your more standard uh, tax services that you would think of an accounting firm providing. So that's, that's my background. That's uh, kind of Flynn Sweeney's background in a nutshell. So let's uh, get into the, the nitty gritty here. What is the, what's the importance of sound financial management? Well, uh, the SBA did a study a few years back and asked businesses that had failed, that had declared for bankruptcy, what was the primary reason that you, that you, uh, that you failed, you know, talking about fails. And uh, the number one, uh, one of the, the big issue, biggest issues was problems with the company's financial structure, not having a good structure in place, not having adequate financing, and so on. So that was, that was one of the, the biggest issues um, that, that companies failed. The second one that was mentioned was tax and IRS issues. And 20% of respondents claimed that that was the biggest reason that their company failed. So when you think about these things, it's, it's a little bit disturbing, especially knowing you know, over half of all businesses fail within the first five years. But the good news is this is an area that we can actually, we can actually manage. We can uh, mitigate the risks. We can set up a good control structure in place, good financial structure so that we can at least um, you know, mitigate the risks and, and, inc and, in and increase our likelihood for success as a small growing business. So other than just keeping the business afloat, what are, what's the real importance of this, this good financial structure? And a few of the things here that I mentioned, you know, really getting a good financial structure, a good uh, record keeping system in place is important from, the, from early on just so you have a way to monitor the company's success. I mean, is the company making money? Is it losing money? If you don't have a good system in place to capture all this data, you're not able to, to say that. Yeah, maybe the, the cash balance in the bank account is, is increasing, but that doesn't really take into consideration everything that a business may uh, be experiencing as far as payables and receivables and the whole cash cycle. So um, 
So just being able to monitor the company's uh, success or failure. If you're going to go out, if you need to grow your business through the use of bank financing or an outside investor, uh, they're going to require you to provide them with good financial information that they can rely on in a timely manner. So be, having a system in place that can generate that information um, you know, when needed is, is crucial. Um, and then just you know, preparing income, payroll tax, sales tax, more of the compliance elements of the business that are going to happen monthly or quarterly or annually. If you don't have a good system to collect that, that can really set you up for some, some big problems down the, uh, down the road. Um, and you know, I, if you're a multiple owner, multiple partner business, get to the end of the year in order to distribute profits. You got to know how well you did, right? You got to know if you made money, if you lost money, just to, to get a good allocation of, of profits. So those, those are some of the reasons. There's certainly more, but I, just kind of setting the foundation for why is it important to have a good, sound financial management structure in place. So who are the key players? The four that we're going to talk about today are the, the CPA, the bookkeeper, the controller, and the CFO. And uh, you know, the first couple are ones that, as a small business owner, you probably have had some had some experience with. Um, you know, from, from day one, a lot of times you'll talk to a CPA or, or have a bookkeeper, or at least be doing some of the bookkeeping yourself. So, so we'll kind of go through those a little bit, probably more quickly than the other two, but if you have any questions, we'll stop so you can ask questions on, on that role and maybe share some of your experiences if you've had, uh, had any, anything interesting. And then as we'll talk about kind of controller and chief financial officer. Um, for smaller, smaller to mid-sized businesses, oftentimes it's kind of a blended role. One company might call it a controller, one might call it a CFO, but uh, you know, with, a, with a smaller company, a lot of times you don't have both of those roles in place until you get to a certain, a certain size where it's really warranted. So we'll talk about those. And then, and then last, we're going to talk about out, outsourced financial resources, which is kind of close to me. Um, that's, that's generally what I do for businesses. And it just um, talk a little bit about how that works and why that might be a good option for some businesses that have a need for more uh, higher level financial skills within the company, but, but either can't afford it or don't need it on a full-time basis. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So first of all, CPA, um, probably uh, just a, got a few characteristics here, and I'm not going to run through all of these, but you know, CPA is going to have passed the national exam, and in order to keep their CPA certificate active, they have to go through uh, 40 hours a year on average of continuing education. So that's, as a, as a user of a CPA, that should provide you with some level of comfort knowing that, um, that they are keeping their skills fresh and up to date. And uh, you know, the states are responsible for that. I just went through my, my uh, audit to look at my, my uh, education for the last three years and got through that and passed and everything. But, but they are checking up on that, so you can take a little bit of comfort when you use a CPA that there's uh, that certification process in place. Uh, here, for the purposes of our conversation today, we're talking about a CPA at an external firm. Not, you, could, you could hire a CPA internally as your accountant, but here we're talking about somebody that you're going to go to for um, you know, knowledge of the tax laws, knowledge of uh, deep knowledge of accounting principles, and so on. Somebody that you're going to go to. Um, and we're talking a little bit about the fees. Generally, for a good CPA in town, you're going to pay $150 an hour or more. You certainly can probably find somebody for less. You can find somebody for a lot more. I know when, um, when I left KPMG as a senior manager, my billing rate was $350 an hour, which um, you know, is, is um, a bit crazy, but, and it's nowhere near that now. But that just kind of gives you uh, an idea of the range, the full range, the full spectrum of, of uh, what, you can, what you can pay for that service. Um, so a CPA, when do you need one? Generally, it's a good idea to talk to a CPA even before you form your company. Um, how, many, how many people in here have a small business and talk to a CPA when they form their company to decide if they were going to be an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp or that kind of thing? So a few people. Um, probably a good idea, similar to an attorney. You know, I would recommend that you talk to those two, two key people. Um, it really does have an impact what legal structure you choose as far as the tax consequences. So it's a good idea to know what those are going in and to have um, kind of hashed that out before you get started in business. And then you're also going to have more of an ongoing relationship throughout your, your company's life cycle, um, whether it's just annual tax planning, tax preparation, or some key events that might trigger the need for a CPA, such as uh, you know, anytime you're going to change ownership in a business, or if you're planning the sale of a business, you're going to want to talk to uh, talk to a good CPA on some of those 
uh, tax consequences. And then if you ever, another time you might need a CPA is if you were uh, getting a bank loan or taking on a new investor, needed to um, have audited or reviewed financial statements, the CPA is who you would go to in those situations, and they would review your financial statements um, and be able to uh, give the, the banker or, or investor some more comfort that the, the financial statements they're looking at are, are accurate. Okay, next we're going to talk about a bookkeeper, and this is another role that a lot of small businesses will, will, will run into from the very beginning. Um, the bookkeeper is the one that's just maintaining more of the day-to-day -day books. They are uh, invoicing clients. They're following up on accounts receivable, make sure the company is getting paid for the work that they've done, um, paying the company's bills on time, doing payroll, reconciling bank statements. So all the day-to-day -day kind of management is where the bookkeeper comes in. And um, you know, for a full-time person in that role, you're probably going to be in the, the $30,000 to $50,000 range per year in the Des Moines market, um, just to give you an idea. And again, it's a, it's a good idea to have somebody in place at the beginning. And oftentimes, in my experience at least, it seems like it's either the owner or the owner's spouse that's doing the books. And that can be, that can be really good in that it's a, it's a good way to save money up front. Uh, and that's, you know, all, all small businesses when they start are usually challenged for, for funding. And so having the owner or owner's spouse is a good way to do that. Um, I can also tell you I've been called in a lot to clean up a lot of uh, messes that have occurred because of that and because they didn't know exactly what um, they, they were supposed to be doing. So just a word of caution, if you, d if you go that route, um, it still may not be a bad idea to bring somebody in and have them look at your, your books on a, on a regular basis to make sure that, that everything looks good. So does anybody have, talking about the bookkeeper and the CPA, anybody have any questions on those two roles? Those are the ones that as, as kind of growing businesses you've probably encountered um, in, some, in, in some form. Does anybody have any comments or any different experiences? Yeah, go ahead. A gentleman does IT security and um, has heard of instances where bookkeepers have been caught embezzling or stealing company funds and what's the best way to prevent that? We'll talk a little bit about that. I think the best way is to have somebody that's supervising them and that's, that's really one of my biggest selling points when I go in and talk to a business is you have a bookkeeper, but who's really looking at what they're doing on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis? And a lot, of, a lot of business owners, that's not their area of expertise. They like to be out selling and, and um, you know, solving problems, figuring out how they can make their operations more efficient. And they don't, they don't have the interest or oftentimes the expertise to really supervise that function. And so that's, uh, you know, a lot of what I do is go into a business and try to put that layer between the bookkeeper and the owner of the company so that they know that somebody else is there to, first of all, answer questions. A lot of times, uh, even if it's not stealing, just uh, mistakes and not knowing what they're doing, they don't really have, a bookkeeper doesn't have anywhere to go and, and, and ask, of somebody, ask somebody a question. So they sometimes will just do it. They have to get it done, they just do it. So just having somebody to bounce ideas off of, I think, is good, and then also um, as that kind of, uh, you know, just um, fraud deterrent or theft deterrent, having somebody, knowing somebody else is looking over and really looking at the detail on a regular basis, I think, deters that. So whether it's somebody that comes in like me on a part-time basis or you, you know, somehow set up some good internal controls within the organization, it is important to keep an eye on, on that role. Okay. With that said, we'll move on to uh, a couple of the more higher level uh, finance accounting positions within the, within the organization, the controller, and then we'll talk about the CFO. And like I said, for, for small businesses, a lot of times the lines are really blurred between these two, uh, these two roles. Um, some companies will call it a controller, some will call it a CFO. Uh, rarely do, do a, does a small business have both of those roles in-house. So that's just something to keep in mind. There'll be a little bit of crossover as we, as we talk about these. Um, so what's, what are some of the controller's characteristics? Typically they're going to have a higher level of experience, six to eight years of, uh, of relevant good industry accounting experience. Oftentimes they're going to be a CPA. And th this is the individual that's really charged with um, setting up the right controls within the company to really safeguard the company's assets and also um, control the accounting to make sure that everything is entered in a timely manner and that the results uh, coming out of the system are good. So that's what the controller is really doing. They're controlling the assets, controlling the, the money, and uh, controlling the accounting within the organization. So 
Um, a typical controller in the Des Moines market seems like that range of 60,000 to 100,000 is kind of the range that I see with most of the, the businesses I work with. And um, like I said, there's a big range because some of the controllers are really glorified bookkeepers and some of them are really closer to a CFO. So it really depends, there's a big spectrum there. And uh, when do you need a controller? I mean, I th typically it's when you get to more of a growth stage in the company, you've made it, you know that you're going to exist for a while, you've, you've kind of proven yourself, um, you're getting, your business is getting a little bit more complicated, you've got a higher volume of transactions that you need to account for and make sure you have controls around, and so that's when you would think, uh, start thinking about bringing a controller in. Um, also, the, the owner or president of the company may want to get more higher level um, analysis out of the financial information and the controller may be able to bring some more of that to the table. And, and then moving into, moving into the CFO role, again, they're gonna be a little bit more experienced than the controller even, a couple, um, you know, 10 plus years of experience. Oftentimes, they'll, they'll be a CPA and an MBA. Um, CFOs really sh should have good communication skills. They're gonna be talking with a lot of external parties, talking to the bankers, auditors, investors, um, other partners, and so they, it's important that they are able to really communicate the company's financial, financial message in a way that, that the parties understand and that is, is accurate. Um, the CFO has overall responsibility for kind of all areas within accounting and finance. So we've got accounting and budget, credit, insurance, tax, treasury, once you start to get a little bit larger. Um, so they're gonna have all of those different uh, responsibilities under their umbrella. Um, CFO, we're, t we're kind of getting into the big leagues as far as salary is going to be a hundred thousand dollar plus job. Oftentimes, a true CFO is also going to have some sort of um, equity compensation component or um, incentive comp, and so this is where uh, you know it, it starts to become, for, especially for a startup or a company that's trying to get to the next level, that's a really big uh, salary to, to bite off and, and to pay somebody full time. So, when do you need? A CFO, it's kind of when you're, you know, generally when your business is starting to become more complex and you're going to have some more um, unique or sophisticated financing uh, needs through, you know, maybe an outside investor is going to come in um, or if you're going to try to grow your business rapidly through merger or acquisition, something like that, it'd be good to have somebody with that higher level of expertise that can go in and um, really uh, do due diligence and, un and understand uh, what what you're getting um, as far as the financial transaction goes. And, or if you're adding multiple product lines and you have some different cost elements to different product lines and just need to be able to get some more um, information there. Those are some, some of the events that might trigger a need for a CFO. Any, any questions on those, on those couple roles, the controller role and the CFO role? Anybody in here have a small business where you have a controller or CFO on staff? Okay. That's not, that's not uncommon at all. Well then, what we're gonna get into next is um, financial outsourcing. Anybody in the room, are they familiar with this concept? It's relatively, uh, relatively new, at least in, in Iowa. I, I know when, uh, when I was doing my own market research in 2005, trying to figure out um, kind of how I was gonna position myself I did a lot of research and I saw, I saw this um, part-time CFO pop up a lot on the coast, it seemed like, especially around where there's a lot of venture activity um, out east or um, out west. But I didn't see a whole lot in, in Des Moines specifically or even um, throughout the Midwest. And so I thought, okay, well, that, that may be a service that, that businesses could really use in the market. Um, what it is is it allows growing businesses the chance to have a part-time controller or CFO um, on an as-needed basis. So if they only need it for a day a month or four days a month or any time in between, um, they can get access to that higher level skill set without having to pay a full-time resource to do it. Um, you know, other benefits are that you get to avoid uh, the payroll tax element. Uh, you have a salary and then you can usually add 25% or 30% for insurance and taxes and benefits. And so as, uh, uh, you know, bringing this rule on, as, on a contract or outsource basis, you avoid those those additional um, expenses that are associated. And like I said, you just pay for what you need. One could be one day, could be four days, somewhere in between. That's kind of the range that most of the businesses I work with um, are, in that, are in that range. And the other nice thing is there's no long-term commitment. As a, as a business owner, I know 
you, you feel a personal responsibility to your employees. So if you're going to hire somebody, you really want to know that you can keep them employed for the long term. It's not the kind of position you want to hire them and then a year later you're like, okay, well, the funds ran dry and we can't, we can't afford you and we're going to have to let you go. So the nice thing about um, contracting these services is that it's, there's no long-term commitment. You can, um, uh, when you don't need the service anymore, if you decide it's not a good fit, you, you're done and um, there's no strings attached. So a lot, of, a lot of the business owners I work with like that, that element of it. It, it just gives them a little bit more flexibility. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the advantages of having this higher level um, skill set within your organization. And it could be whether you have it on full time or if you're, you bring it on part time. But some of the things that it's going to bring to the table is it's going to bring more accurate and timely financial information for decision making. And you know, how, that, how a relationship typically begins is we will sit down with the business owner or president along with the accountant or bookkeeper and really define a process that's going to happen each and every month. So we may say that the bookkeeper is going to have all of their duties done, banks reconciled, loans reconciled, by the fifth day of the month. And then they'll, we'll, that'll give um, our firm a little bit of time to do our financial analysis and review. And then we'll sit down and have a, a monthly financial meeting with the owner of the business on the 10th of the month or on the 15th of the month. And what that does is it holds everybody accountable. It's, it holds the bookkeeper accountable. They know that somebody else is going to be reviewing what they've done. They can't let things slide and, and let a, a month go by or let a few days go by. They have to get everything, everything done by a certain deadline. It also holds the owner of the business accountable because it's so easy as a, as a business owner, you're pulled so many different directions to let a month or two months or three months go by without looking at your financial information. And so, um, it really brings everybody together. It kind of defines the process. And that's one of the first things that we do is we say, what, is, what are we going to do here? What are the expectations? And um, you know, I think that accountability is a really big part of a good, strong financial <coughs> structure within a business. Um, and on that same note, it's going to provide better information for budgeting and cash flow. A lot of times, the, um, if you're a, a business that you know, maybe just has one or two accounting staff, like bookkeepers, in the organization. They're really, really good uh, dealing with the detail and getting things in, but it's hard to be really good in the detail and then also kind of have the higher level vision and be able to look, um, identify trends and forecast and look forward with the information. And so that's, that's where I think having this resource, uh, this regular resource as a part of your financial um, team really adds to the, the usefulness of your financial information as far as a forward looking um, indicator. Um, the third bullet point there is it allows entrepreneurs to really focus their energies and their time on their core competencies. And we talked a, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but most, most of the business owners that I know, are, they, they enjoy and they're really good at sales and operations, really honing the operations, solving problems, that kind of thing. Um, accounting and finance is, is usually not the area where they feel most comfortable nor where they really enjoy what they're doing. And so it allows them to you know, go have more face time, go spend time with customers, do more problem solving, and that kind of thing. So that's a big, uh, big point of feedback that I receive from a lot of, a lot of business owners. And then the fourth point uh, is kind of, kind of to, your, to your question. It's a, it's a natural fraud and theft deterrent. Just the mere, the mere presence of having somebody there, first of all, really, uh, I think, just keeps them accountable, keeps them honest, knowing someone else is going to review their work, uh, is going to be looking at cash movements throughout the month to see if there's anything unusual, if there's any new vendors that have been created that are outside of um, kind of the ordinary vendors that you would normally pay. So some things like that that, that, that that we would look at on a regular basis to make sure that, um, you know, or at least try to mitigate. There are, there's some, some things can go undetected even with good controls, but most of the time if you've got somebody looking over it, it's going to, uh, it's going to mitigate that risk. Another, another really good advantage of this kind of service is it provides continuity um, in, within your accounting and finance team. Um, for whatever reason, bookkeepers, accountants, there's a lot of turnover in this role. A lot of times, um, you know, just a lot of movement between companies. And when you know, somebody leaves, they walk out the door with a lot of really good knowledge. You've got to train somebody else. Um, with your, your processes and your procedures. And so if you have somebody else that's there for the longer term 
and really is kind of well-versed in your company's accounting and finance processes, they're able to come in and mentor or train any, the newcomer, the new accountant or bookkeeper, um, and, it, and it just kind of makes that a, a much smoother process. And uh, next, another, another point, and a big source of my referrals are from bankers. Um, a lot of times bankers uh, call me and they say, yes, I've got this company that uh, they've got a really good product or service, but they've kind of gotten astray as far as their finances are concerned. We'd really like to have an expert in there uh, dealing with them on a regular basis. So I get a lot of calls like that. And I think, um, you know, regardless of whether the call came through that or if you're just a business and you're trying to raise your your image in the eyes of outside investors or bankers, having somebody that you can say, hey, this is, this is my CFO, this is my controller, that adds, a, that adds a lot to the company's image. And so that's something that um, I hear a lot from, from business owners as well, that, hey, I really like this because I feel like I can go out and it just adds to the company's credibility by having this, this um, team member. And then again, the sounding board for the owner and president. I mean, as the owner of a company, it's not like you're um, a large organization like Wells Fargo, you're having management meetings every day. Oftentimes, you're kind of on an island. You don't have anyone else to discuss higher level business decisions with. It's kind of nice to have um, somebody that you can bounce ideas off of and that is going to understand the financial implications of, of um, you know, a big decision in the company's life. So those are some of the, some of the advantages. And that's, that's really all that I've prepared. I wanted to keep it pretty short because I know this is kind of a dry topic. And I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions if people have questions. If people want to hear about specific examples of how I've worked, that's perfectly fine too. But I thought I'd leave it now and just let people ask any questions so they're more targeted to what you're interested in. Uh, one endorsement for these types of services, I just re that, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, Brian's point was that uh, he just recently sold a business and having this kind of outside party involved, whether in, a, in your case, was it a CPA that actually provided audited or so it could be a CPA that provides audited or reviewed financial statements, or it could be, you know, a lot of, a lot of my clients do kind of rely on me for this. And the bankers um, and, and uh, investors that we talk to are really happy with the service. So a lot of times they're not so concerned about it actually being an audit or a review. And sometimes they are. Sometimes they need to have an audit review for the file. But um, oftentimes they're not so concerned with that. They're more concerned with just knowing that there's somebody that's outside and that really understands what they're doing and can pr provide reliable financial information. So I've seen that both ways. You know, sometimes you need to have an audit or a review, and other times they're just happy knowing that there's, there's a CPA, whether it's in-house, but they, they have a good idea of what's, what's going on. So yeah, that's a good point. Anybody else have any questions or comments? That's a good point, Doug. Yeah, just speaking to the, the virtualness and how you can work virtually nowadays. I, um, last was on a, a Skype conference call with um, a potential new client in New York who had been referred to me. And so um, I, she sent over stuff, and we're going to start working together. And that's how we're going to, um, you know, she's a startup. She's developed an iPhone app that is, uh, you know, there's, there's thousands and thousands of them out there. So some of them will work and some of them won't. But she's got an interesting idea <clears throat> and is looking for investors. And so, uh, so yeah, we'll see where that goes. But it, it, to that point, it really can be, it can be delivered fairly virtually, especially with technology today. That's not really an issue. Well, related to that, a lot of any particular stories that come to mind. Well, um, you know, a lot of for a lot of businesses, the the lifeline in the past was always the the line of credit, and a couple of years ago that became a lot more challenging. I had a lot of clients where you may have already had a line, and we went into renew a line of credit, and the bank all of a sudden was concerned with debt to equity ratios. So they, they start putting in place a lot of covenants and that kind of thing. Or if you're looking for a first time line of credit, it, it, for, for a while there it was virtually impossible to even get one. Um, and so you started seeing a lot of, of products such as like receivables factoring. Um, where I've had a, a couple of businesses that have gone that route where they maybe um, have accounts receivable, but they maybe don't get paid for 60 days. And so in the meantime, uh, there are companies out there that will lend up to you know, 80, 90 percent even of those accounts receivable balances as just kind of operating capital for your business. So that's one that once um, kind of the, 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 the bank financing kind of ran dry a couple years ago, um, had some other businesses that were looking for alternatives. And that's one that, that comes to mind is um, accounts receivable factoring. 
Um, you know, certainly, just private equity money. Again, people were people in the last couple of years got a little bit more desperate. You know, there was a time, five, five to ten years ago, banks would give almost anybody a loan, and once the kind of financial crisis hit, that that spigot dried up. There really wasn't a whole lot of money to go around. Everyone was really really cautious, and so. Um, that's where I think there's, there's been a little bit of development over the last few years in the private um, investor networks as well. And I think more of that money is, is flowing. Um, and you're going you're gonna to pay more as a business owner for that kind of thing, but um, I've seen more and more instances of that money being out there at least.